Hi, I'm Mara Webster with InCreative Company, and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. We are a year-round talk series bringing you the best creative voices across film, television, and theater. And today I'm so thrilled to be joined by the wonderful Richard Dormer to talk about his new series, The Watch. And I wanted to start by asking you about the way that you kind of deconstruct your character when you're working with the scripts, because one of the things that you're so fantastic at as a performer is taking characters who on the surface at the beginning really seem like they're gonna be one thing. And then by the end of the journey, we see so many different layers and so many different sides of them. But obviously you have to bring that into your performance right from the very first scene. So what does that look like in terms of working with the script and figuring out those deeper layers so that you can go straight in and start constructing it in your performance? Um, I think basically um, what, what I like to do is, um, well, first of all, you gotta trust the writing. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, the, if you're cast in the part, they, they trust you as an actor, uh, knowing that, you know, you, you're going to be able to do that and, and bring out depth and different, um, you know, the layers of peeling the onion. Um, with, with, with this guy, uh, he's just, even, even uh, the first description of him in the, the, the Discworld books is mm -hmm. Sam Vimes slowly curled into a ditch or something you know on the side of the street with this ball of whiskey um and that 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 basically that says a lot about what uh, kind of character is you know that he's dissolute that he's that he's a drinker that he's he's given up hope but as we as we as we know that um everybody has many layers um and that that's just something i think that uh, the, what that makes drama there, there's no such thing as good or bad or there's no such thing as you know everyone has has, has levels and the, the joy of a really good part um, uh, with every situation that comes along you can choose what to show the audience um, the same way that we you know people surprise us every, every, uh, all, the, all the time in, in, in real life they can be incredible at maths and but not great spellers or you know so it's um this this was just a i just i literally jumped in i just jumped in i had my boots and i found my walk um the cigar and um yeah and i just i just slalomed freestyle to you know <laughs> Were the boots kind of the starting point to figuring out that physicality? Because it's something where every single scene that you're in, there's such a specific way to how he moves and, and kind of functions in life and the body language that he exhibits. Yeah, yeah. No, it's very, it's a, the, 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 I think um, my, I work with my feet. I always have done. Maybe it's, it's mm -hmm. my rada training, darlings. It's, um, you, you, you work with the feet uh, and you work your way up, you know, because that's the point that's in touch with the ground. It's it, they're the things that carry you, the things that, that you stand very tall, or you you know you're a humble person, or yeah. so. Um, yeah, I think the boots, um, they were a great pair of boots. As soon as I put them on, I thought, I I, I know this guy, I know him, yeah. um, and he's slightly bandy legged, um, scrawny, skinny, dishevelled creature. And uh, yeah, it all just came, and the eyes as well, the dark eyes mm -hmm. and the, the grime. I just thought that this man is such a part of Ankhmore Pork, the city. You know, it's a dirty, grimy city that I literally think that uh, the, the dirt comes out of his pores from the inside out. And even if he had a bath um, and you cleaned him, like, like the Simpsons thing when you know, cleans the kitchen and the door swings and it's a mess again. He's just that, you know? So I'm more pork. He is a kind of a, a an embodiment of the good and bad of uh, the city, yeah. Yeah, and you were mentioning even just like the smoky eyes that he has and he's got such a distinctive visual look in terms of the hair and the makeup as well. Did you know what those elements roughly were gonna look like in and how the team wanted to construct you know, the hair and makeup aspects before you were on set, or was that something that you kind of really discovered in the later stages of pre-production? It's something, it's something, and, and this is the, the real joy, I think, of being an actor as you uh, 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 increase in years and experience, is that people start to listen to you more about how you, how you see uh, characters. And I, I think I'm very lucky enough to have played 
uh, kind of iconic looking. You know, if you saw their silhouette, you'd know who they were. Um, and with this guy, I really wanted, um, uh, he, he, he was a bit more modern in design, the way they designed, but I wanted a three quarter length coat to suggest that he's old school. That's what they dressed like, you know, th uh, 20 years ago and now they're all modern and, you know, um, so he's like original Star Trek and the other ones are generations, you know, but it's the similar colors and everything, but I, I really wanted to create a silhouette um, that people would instantly uh, recognize and the, the little stubbly chin and the, the cigar and, you know, it's, uh, he, I think he is. I, I'm like, I'm looking at it, the show and it, it already feels like it's been here, like, or that it, it, it exists. And uh, it just looks historical in some way that it's always been there but it's completely new and unique. So um, yeah, the, 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 the visual aspect of the character mm -hmm. is huge, I think, even though I, I'm a very internal actor, but yeah. uh, everything's working on the outside and you know exactly what it is you are, everything else hopefully uh, follows. Yeah, now that you've said that, I can see the silhouette in my mind as well. And you're absolutely right. Like it's such a such an imprint. And and you know, obviously in terms of, of the source material, you've got the books as a tool available to you to kind of dive into his world a bit more. But what what were the elements of of discovering who he was and you know, perhaps research elements that you found to be really helpful beyond the books themselves and beyond just the pages of the scripts? Um, I didn't really do uh to be honest, I didn't do um any research, uh, like I, 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 I read nine of the books in my teens. Mm -hmm. So I knew the world, I knew the humor, I knew the style um, and it can be slapstick. It can be ironic. It can be, you know, satirical. It's, it's, it's biting, cutting, cruel sometimes, but always uh, like great humor. It has to come from a truth. It's like any drama. Um, and I think even though, uh, uh, you know, you see me and I, you know, he's funny, but the, the, there's a real, he's a, he's, he, there's a little soul in there, you know, who's, who's, who's very human and has been hurt like all of us. Um, so, yeah, I just, I lived every day. Every day I turned up on set and it was just the most amazing sets and the actors, incredible actors and just the design. Um, so, it was so easy just to believe that this was my life. In seven months, every single day, apart from a day off, weekend. I mean, I was in every day. So it, yeah. it, it became real to me, very, very real. And even the, 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 the insane humour, even though we're creasing and crying, laughing at some point, there's a truth to it all. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a real truth. And um, yeah. One of the elements with the humor that I was really interested in how it kind of was constructed and how it came together were the scenes where you're talking with the talking sword, which Matt Berry voices. Yes. Because so much about comedic delivery is about the rhythm and, and kind of the energy of, of the back and forth and the banter and the pacing of it. So yes. given that you were filming those scenes and obviously not with Matt Berry kind of, how did you kind of have to uniquely approach finding the rhythm and the pacing of what the humor was going to be when you didn't have him there as a scene partner to bounce off of in the same way you usually would? Well, we had a very good um, South African actor um, and he, he was reading in the lines and he was always there. And uh, he had a kind of, like he was doing a kind of, you know, like, oh, oh I Gene, like kind of Ronnie Wood type, you know, all right, mate. And he was doing, you know, so he was really helpful. Um, uh, he was a great guy. So, um, I think we all just knew because of the tone of the scripts, we, we kind of knew even before we knew it was going to be Matt, we, we knew that the, it, it was going to have that delivery. Um, and also because it's a sword, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, it's like a, in, in, in a world like this, it's filled with magic. You tolerate magic because you live side by side with it. It's just another talking sword, you know, um, so and that is funny as well, that we're not surprised that it's a talking sword. It can talk, so big deal, you know, that I've got a nine foot tall troll friend and I speak to death occasionally, you know what I mean? So uh, yeah, it was just, uh, we, we just ran with it. And I love 
Matt Berry because one of my favorite shows is uh, what we do, um, The Shadows. Yes, the Jackie um, Daytona episode that he leads is one of the best oh, episodes on television. It's 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 the one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. I am uh, me and my girlfriend were just total fans, and when I heard he was gonna do the, it was just like it's perfect. There's nobody else could do it. That is exactly I think what we all kind of imagined it to be. You know that kind of oh right, you know that kind of way he has of talking. <laughs> right he's so, got such a distinctive uh, delivery that like you kind yes. of almost know what you're right you know what that voice is going to be yes yes totally yeah I, I just yeah I think I think it's brilliant he's very very funny <laughs> and you you know you were mentioning the incredible production design and mm -hmm. it's so intricately detailed and one of the things that's really exciting about a show like this is that there's no detail there by accident every single element has been completely meticulously planned out mm -hmm. and I, I wanted to ask about how that informs the way that you kind of move within the space as well, because there's so many elements that you can kind of interact with and, and kind of like physically move within in a completely different way when it is such a detailed constructed world like this. Yes, um, it, it really does, it informs a lot. But the other thing is that, that um, Sam Vimes has, has grown up in this world. So it's like anything, you know, you, you stop looking at, um, a, a London red bus because you see it every day. If you see a, a, a talking sword, zoom, yeah, you know what I mean. So they don't, yeah. they, they 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 flow through the world because it's normal to them. Everything is normal. The viewer is going to be going, "Whoa! Did you? Oh my God! Oh, invisible birds! You know the posters, everything, the money, the current, the the the, the drinks, the style of the clothes, the the weather, the." Every single thing about this is just natural um, mm -hmm. to these characters. But it did give us, uh, we had to just forget about it because that's what those characters would do. You know, they're, they're, mm -hmm. they grew up with magic. So, um, yeah, and I think it's very funny as well that, you know, that they're so kind of blasé and casual about, you know, this, oh, death again, what does he want, you know, or, yeah. <laughs> The troll, Dritus, is just extraordinary. And he's real, it's not CGI. That was a nine foot tall uh, stunt man. He's a brilliant actor, yeah. able to act through all that, those prosthetics. Um, yeah, it was all there, it was, it was, uh, it, it's, it's a joy. But like I say, mm -hmm. the, these, these people, it's just normal to them, which I think is fantastical, uh, that they don't react to like a, a, a washing machine suddenly appears out of nowhere uh, from another dimension. It's like, uh, will it be there tomorrow? You know what I mean? It's, yeah. That is funny because the viewer is going, what? But the characters, this is just normal, you know? So that that's, yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah. And beyond the magical elements, there's obviously a lot of social constructs and kind of like rules of, of society and how it functions, which are completely different. You know, we see that with with the watch itself, where the majority of illegal behavior is no longer illegal, but there are still kind of rules such as with the guilds, the fact that you're not allowed to attack a member of another guild. And that's a loophole mm -hmm. around certain things and certain things that the watch can investigate, like tax evasion. Did you, did you find yourself just kind of like mapping out and like thinking about what the specific rules of and constructs of this society were at all because they are different to an everyday world and, and they really influence a lot of the, the decisions and choices that he makes as a character? Yeah, but it's like the same thing again. It's like, um, you know, you, you learn it and then you forget about it. Yeah. Because in, in real life, you know, even cops can't remember mm -hmm. the, the rule book. They'd have to go, well, what does that say? Um, so you have a broad sweeping idea about the, the laws of the world, but I think uh, Sam Bimes is so drunk most of the time is that he's forgotten most of it. And um, you know, <laughs> and then along comes Carrot, this idealistic young man, and uh, Vimes looks at him like that could have been me, you know, I once had hope like that, that I could maybe make a difference, but then the claws of the world, uh, the claws got into the flesh, tore all that hope away, um, but he also admires it, um, this, this, uh, this fresh-faced 
uh, uh, youngster who can actually teach him quite a bit. Yeah. And, uh, and there's, you know, there's many uh, elements of this that they all uh, learn so much about themselves through the others because they start to listen and they start to believe that there is um, another alternative um, rather than the one they've just been suffering all their lives. Right. And it's so great to watch the the difference in the dynamics that he has with the different members of the watch, because they all have a different kind of like storied history with him. And throughout mm. the show as well, we really get the opportunity to learn a lot of the backstory elements of each of these characters and how they came to be the way that they are and where they are as mm. well. So what did that look like in terms of the way that you were working with those cast members in developing the different individualized rapports before you went into shooting those first scenes together? Well, do you know what we didn't um, we didn't rehearse them, so mm -hmm. we read it through, and because uh, I think it was very well cast, incredibly well cast, um, they they just trusted us to do it, and luckily, it worked. Um, like I mean, for example, Tick uh, Cherry um, is um, Vimes's mother and father figure and uh, sister, even though he's older. It's like uh, they are um, all those things. Now, uh, say Angua, who's terrifying because she's a werewolf. She transforms into a thing that can, like, you know, kills people. But that's his daughter that he never had. That's how, I, you know, um, Sybil comes into his life. It's well, it's Sybil is the, the the woman that has been in his dreams, but he's been too drunk to remember his dreams. Mm -hmm. And he would never dare to dream that anyone like that would look at him or even love him. Um, you know, so there, everyone has a... And then Carrot is the younger version of himself that he resents because he's got it all ahead of him and I've, I've ruined it, I believe. I've, I've destroyed myself, you know? So... Um, those things just, we just, it just happened. It, it was magical. Um, and we all trusted one another, um, which is a, a gift to be able to work with people who just, yeah, I trust you, you know, trust me and yeah, we'll play. And it was, it was fun to go to work every day. Yeah. Within the fact that he is kind of a haphazard drunk as well, that in of itself gives a lot of detail to who he is as a character, because that's his way of trying to escape himself mentally, even though he can't, he kind of continues mm. to try and do that a lot, you know, and there's, there's kind of an element of, of sadness and loneliness and regret within this character as well, which mm. I think kind of sits hand in hand with the drunkenness. How did you think about the way that you wanted to, to carry that side of him and, and that, because it's such an internal journey that you're really managing to convey through your performance? Yeah, well, you know, I'm, I, I've, um, I've, I've known a few um, alcoholics in my life. Nice. And the thing about um, uh, the alcoholics is that it, it, you, you, you find that, they're, they're very sensitive people. Um, they're incredibly sensitive people. And that's probably maybe one of the reasons why they, they, they numb themselves. So, um, and I believe that all comedy, uh, you know, it has two faces. There's comedy and tragedy. It's, it's, it's the same thing. Um, so uh, I, I, it has to come from a place of truth. And... I don't think I'm um, I'm mugging, um, you know. Um, what's the word? I don't think I'm doing a pantomime drunk. I think I'm doing a playing a drunk who has feelings, um, who hurts, who hopes, who dreams, mm -hmm. like 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 everybody else. Uh, but he just has this Achilles heel, mm -hmm. um, you know. And everybody in the world has an Achilles heel, whether it be social media or whether it be cigarettes or chocolate or you know binge watching Netflix shows or whatever everybody escapes everybody needs uh, but you don't you know you, you can't judge them for, for 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 one thing you can't let them be defined by just you know uh, that person's a painter decorator or that's a doctor you know where we're, people are incredibly intricate uh, little mechanisms and um, the, I think real uh, good characters and good drama uh, is always surprising you 
mm -hmm. because you're always going to see something that you you might even as uh, suspected was there but yeah. uh, it, it, it just um uh, just like life people can surprise you uh, for good and bad so mm -hmm. yeah yeah and there's also the ability within the show to see a lot of where that regret stems from in him through the flashback sequences you know and obviously several years of have, have passed between those two points in time do you find it useful to really kind of build out and, and construct a lot of backstory to fill in those gaps for yourself at all um yes i did actually it's weird like i i, I was going to say no but actually um the the, the writer the main writer, Simon Allen, tell you, uh, every night I was going home learning lines and writing memories. Hmm. The, the, the memories that uh, I think when you get into a character, you can create an entire history. Mm -hmm. um, not, not a backstory, but an actual history because you start to dream like the character. You start to see the world. You start to pick up their little ticks and their, their, their worldview. So... Um, uh yeah it was it it um it, it affected me uh, uh deeply uh playing the part and also it's just i, I love seeing the underdog rise up to his full height and the spine going kick, 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 kick. he hasn't done it in so long and daring to yeah. try to be different to try and do the right thing i think that's that's interesting right and in terms of what you just said with him doing the right thing, that there, there are kind of a lot of moments of empathy that we see coming from his, him as well. You know, there's a line that another character mentions about, you know, oh, the problem with you is that you would always be willing to starve rather than kill someone, you know? So it's like, we know, we know a lot about his moral compass and, you know, we see the empathy that he has with a lot of the characters with the watch and that kind of like paternal role that he, he takes on. How did you think about that in relation to a lot of the interactions that you have with characters? Because it's something that he doesn't want to admit is part of his personality, but it really kind of like sears through in these smaller, quieter moments. Yeah, I mean, he, he, um, he doesn't like to reveal himself, but he, he of course, uh, is revealing himself when he's drunk, but he doesn't remember being drunk. Mm -hmm. um, um, but, you know, the, the, the watch, the team, um, uh, Cherry, Angua, mm -hmm. Detritus, um, they, they all know the good in him. And they know that any uh, grumpiness or cantankerousness or, or hopelessness um, um, is just a cover for someone who's got an incredibly sensitive soul and is very caring and very fatherly. Um, and also uh, just remember that uh, the, uh, the South African uh, crew uh, called me uncle, Uncle Rich, which is, uh, I didn't understand. So I'm thinking, Why do they think I'm really old or so? You know, it's a term of endearment. It's uh, uncle means, um, you know, you're, we, we like and respect you, which is a, is a beautiful thing. So that 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 really warmed me. I, I love the crew so much. I just think they're beautiful, um, beautiful uh, people, incredible. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of love. There was a lot of love there, you know, from the actors, from everybody. So that bled into it as well and fueled, because um, I think he's sentimental. Vimes is sentimental. But we realize that later, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, that yeah, there's, there's, wow. There's a lot of elements to this character. I want to play this character again. <laughs> I want to explore more. Yeah, yeah, lots, of, lots to explore. I was also really interested in the stunt work that you do on the show because you've taken on a number of roles where there's been really extensive stunt work that you've done before and you always find a way to kind of really craft a performance within those scenes as well. But, you know, with this character, going back to what we were talking about earlier with the physicality and the way that he holds himself and the way that he walks and the way that he moves, I wanted to ask about what was specific about the, the stunt work that you were doing here and thinking about how he would move within those scenes in a completely different way to any of the characters that you've played before. Before. Yeah, I, well, I think it, a lot comes down to the shoes and the coat yeah. um, because he doesn't just turn, he spins and tries not to fall over. You know what I mean? He, he, he's constantly, he, he's like, um, uh, like Douglas Adams said, the only way, the way to fly is when you fall, forget that you're going to hit the ground. Mm -hmm. And it's like, uh, uh, Vimes just, 
he's like a he has forward momentum when he moves he moves you know and even if he's falling forward he'll just keep falling forward you know he's he, he he's just um he's he, he's that kind of and i did most of my stunts i did uh in fact i did pretty much all of them apart from some wire work when i get beaten up by a monster um spinning through the air I didn't do that one but and i didn't fall down a sand dune um but i did uh eat sand i did eat sand for for my job um in the desert um but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very physical rule, and I had to get uh, uh, ch chiropractic treatment for my back because it had uh, kind of grown crooked from all the the hunched uh, turmoil of playing him. Yeah, um, yeah, it's it, it's been a it was it took it took a couple of months, three four months to recover from from mm -hmm. from playing that that role. Yeah. And within within his role within the watch, you know, he's obviously the captain and he's kind of got this authority and leadership position with them, but he asserts it in a very untraditional way. He knows that when he talks that they will all listen and that they'll follow and that ultimately his decision on what to do is going to be the final say in everything, but he doesn't really kind of like overtly assert his power. So how did you figure out the way that he was going to kind of take on that leadership leadership authority position because it is in such a different dynamic than how we're used to seeing characters take it on well i think um i think he's more surprised when people take his orders because yeah. one he's always drunk um uh two he's quite embarrassed that he's always drunk and three he's slightly amazed that anyone takes him seriously at all so, uh, uh, and, and I think he also knows that they, they humor him um, because they're grateful to him for, for bringing them, for giving them a second chance at life to belong to something. Um, so he has a kind of, um, you know, Fagin, the, Ron Moody played him in the, um, the Oliver. He's like that only, but, but nicer. Um, you know what I mean? So he's, he's, he um, he's just amazed actually that uh, that he's still alive and that um, <laughs> and I, I actually do think he, he he's very insecure that because when he makes a, 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 a like, well, we're going to do it this way that's my plan nobody else's plan it's my plan we're going to do this right and and every time he looks heroic and I'm going to do this right it's like oh no uh, he realizes that it's he doesn't look heroic at all. He looks mm -hmm. foolish and yeah. silly and the others know it, but they don't want to hurt his feelings. I don't know. I'm trying to uh, put it in a certain way. I'm just, I, I'm kind of coming at it from an emotional level. So it's hard to be specific about what I'm trying to say, but um, it, it, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I need to watch it again now because uh, just to see the, the, the cogs whirring away in my head. <laughs> figure out how you pulled all the magic together. On, on no a idea. totally different note, I was interested in the fact that, you know, you started out your career very specifically in theater, not just as a performer, but also a writer and, and very consciously eschewed going into screen work with television and, and with film and was something that you yeah. weren't even trying to broach, you know, in part because of as being an Irish actor, thinking that you would be perceived in a certain way in the types of roles that you were being offered. And, and yeah. I know that part of the journey and shift when you finally took on screen work was also an agent that you then took on and were working with who, who kind of gave you that, that confidence. But it was really fascinated in, you know, especially with that breadth and amount of experience in your career, what that journey was like in kind of overcoming something and, and finding the confidence to step into a space that was so outside of your comfort zone professionally and creatively at that point. Um, and what that experience was like, you know, ha with that level of experience, stepping into spaces that were completely new and, and mediums that were asking for a completely different style of approach and craft and, and use of your medium as an actor. Um, it, it was it was pretty scary. I mean, when I got they, they uh, I was cast um, I, uh, um, as Dan Anderson. It was my first lead in a show in Fortitude. I actually went in for a, it was a supporting part um, to read for you know uh, it was a supporting part, and then they 
they phoned my agent that day and said, would you ask him, would he like to read for the lead? And it describes Dan Anderson as six foot four, dark and bear-like. Now, I am the opposite of all those things. But it just shows you that, you know, if, if someone sees something in you, like an, uh, an element, like a little kernel, whatever that is that's in the character, uh, you know, you can do anything. And I think my, 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 my theatre, um, because in theory, you know, you work maybe three plays a year. So you, you're constantly on your feet. You're always thinking um, physically as an actor, you, you're always um, using your body and you, you, you're, you're um, creating. But the, the other thing is when I got the part and I, the, the director, um, uh, it was uh, Sam, the, the director, and he, he took me into the office before we did the first scene. And I thought, here we go. He's going to fire me. And I haven't even, I haven't even got started in the first day. And he just said, relax, remember to breathe. You're here because we want you to be here. You're, you're our guy. And I, I, I cried. Um, because I thought, oh, you thought you were going to fire me. Uh, he says, no, this is it. You've got to believe in yourself because you're, you're the guy, you know? And what that is, is because also because I'm Northern Irish and I grew up, um, uh, every time someone heard the, the Northern Irish accent, it was on the news because there was a bomb in Belfast or whatever, you know, and people associated with the, the, the troubles in Northern Ireland. So, uh, I, I felt like a second class citizen and that has followed me until recent years, until maybe the last five, four or five years um, that I've got the confidence to believe, no, I'm just as good as, as, um, uh, as, as someone from anywhere in the world. Uh, it's not my fault that the troubles happened, but um, which is interesting then because that leads on to Sam Vimes that he has that voice that we associate or used to associate with something negative. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, there, there, there's, I know what, what being vulnerable is because uh, all my life, even as an actor, uh, you, you gotta be, you gotta have balls of brass, but you know, inside uh, you're, you're always going, am I good enough? Am I good enough, you know? And in terms of, of playing Sam in this series, what, it, what are the aspects of that experience and, and the skills that it required from you that you see kind of carrying through into, into future projects that will continue to sit with you or skills that you feel that you evolved and enhanced from this experience? Well, um, the major skill um, that I have uh, found um, in doing the watch is the electric guitar because we form a punk band. It's a long story why we form a punk, uh, punk band, but it, it, it's to get into one of the guilds um, so that we can infiltrate another guild. But um, the uh, uh, electric guitar, all my life, I don't know how I have not picked one up. I, as soon as I picked it up, I fell in love. I now have three really lovely electric guitars. I play it every day. And in 10 months, I have, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm self-taught, but um, I just love it. It's, it really has changed my life in so many good ways. It's just a stress reliever. It's just, it's, I love skills. You know, I, I love learning new skills, like playing the piano or I uh, play ukulele or mandolin or harmonica, or I'm, I'm gonna learn how to play the drums because Adam in the show plays, uh, he's a great drummer. And uh, I've asked him to teach me how to play the drums. So next season, uh, I learn drums. This season, electric guitar. <laughs> There'll be an actual The Watch Band by the end of. <laughs> there will be. There will. I've said to them, that, "Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do it." <laughs> <laughs> well, also Paul K. Paul K. is a brilliant musician, and um, everybody said they they knew uh, that we were both together because you could hear us. You could just hear the thrashing uh, in our trailers. We would just go in, set up the thing, and just sit with electric guitars, playing as loud as possible. Because um, we used to do that on, uh, on Thrones. We all played instruments, and we had a little band and everything. So, um, yes. yeah, I finally learned how to play. I'm 
still learning, but uh, yeah, electric guitar, amazing. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for, for talking with us this afternoon all about the show. And I hope that everyone watching this will, will dive straight in and, and do a full binge watch of, of the series. Thank you so much, Richard. Thank you so much. It was lovely talking to you.